is recorded. Um, we will be posting this to our Yammer community and later on it'll be uploaded to YouTube as well. So thank you all so much for joining for our sleep webinar. This is a highly requested topic. Um, we've got lots of great content for you today. We'll monitor the chat throughout. We'll try to get to all of your questions. And if we can't answer them here, if we need to look up some more information for you, we'll um, definitely get back to you. Um, so we will get started. So thank you for joining our sleep webinar. My name is Anna Green. I'm the Wellbeing Program Manager for our Healthy Together team. Um, we'll be sharing the slide deck so you can see all of this lovely information later on if you want. Um, just a little bit about me. Uh, my name is Susie. Hi. Um, I have been with Medtronic. I think this is middle of week four for me officially, but I've have six years of experience. I'm super excited to be here to be able to share all this super fun information with you. Hi, my name is Laura Heyman, and I've been with Medtronic now for um, coming up to one and a half years. I started right before the pandemic. Um, and I'm really excited to discuss all of our sleep habits and what our body does during sleep and to share that information with all of you. All right, so I will be launching our first poll question here. So on average, how many hours of sleep do you get each night? So answer that question that's on your screen. Answer it honestly. There's nothing, no, no, no bad can come from it. <laughs> we'll let everyone vote here. Just your best guess. Give you about 15 more seconds. Let everyone vote. So on average, how many hours of sleep do you get each night? Awesome, thank you so much. I will share those results. So we're looking pretty good. We've got a few three to four hours. Um, definitely the middle range is that six to seven, a few eight plus. Um, so it's just kind of good to see where everyone's coming from. We all could use some more restful sleep. I think that's why you all are all here today. Um, thank you. Awesome. So I'm gonna go ahead and keep going with this whole sleep thing. I mean, since we're here, right? Um, so just a quick different, uh, what the recommendations are as we age, we need less sleep. Um, baby is obviously 12 to 17 hours, can include naps, um, all the way up through adults, typically the seven to nine range. So the fact that we were six to seven, I'd say we're doing pretty good. Um, so just kind of wanted to touch on those. You'll obviously get this deck so you can look at it a little bit more for all of your kiddos at home as well. I wanted to jump into sleep cycles relatively briefly here. Um, just going through the three stages of non-REM sleep and then REM sleep, just so you get an idea of what we're going through. Um, stage one is our very light sleep. This is as we're falling asleep, typically five to 10 minutes, unless you're having a really hard time falling asleep, but we're not going to talk about that right this second. Um, but this is when you're falling asleep. Sometimes you can feel your partner twitching. Um, I know personally I've like twitched myself awake even, um, but this is our wakeful relaxation stage one. Um, stage two is our light sleep. It's typically about 20 minutes. Um, and this is where our brain actually starts processing information from the day. This is where all of our memories from the day can kind of get sorted into long-term memory. Um, if any of you guys have seen the 2015 film Inside Out, um, they kind of allude to this process. And so that is in actually stage two of your sleeping. Body temperature drops, heart rate slows, and you're able to create those memories. Um, in stage three is our deep sleep. This is our restorative sleep where we relax, where we heal um, 10, five to 15 minutes. It's actually longer in the beginning of our night than it is at the end of our night. We spend more time in that deep sleep in the morning, or not in the morning, in the beginning of your sleep and a little bit less time at the end of the sleep. Um, 
blood pressure, breathing rate all drops. You're really, really relaxed here in that stage three. In our REM cycle, um, we have our, our vivid dreaming. This is where your body, your mind are actually more active. However, your body actually paralyzes all of the arms, the legs, so that you don't act out your dreams and potentially injure yourself or whomever else is in the bed with you. Um, starting about 90 minutes after you fall asleep is your first REM cycle. And then that time increases as the longer you sleep. So the first time you're in that REM sleep, it might only be 10 minutes, but by the end of the night, you might be spending more time in your REM cycle. Um, this is a quick, I guess, graph, I, I would say chart. Um, you go through these sleep cycles multiple times in one night, and it's not a linear thing. You don't always have to go from stage one to stage two to stage three. You can go from stage two to three to one to two to four to, well, I guess, REM, not four. Um, on this particular thing, it has stage three and stage four. I just lumped those together because they are very, very, very similar as far as the restorative properties in stage two three and stage four, but you can kind of tell how you don't get to that deep sleep at the end of the, your night. And you spend a little bit more in that REM cycle kind of at the top there too. So it's kind of cool to just see how your body can potentially flow through the longer you're asleep through each of these cycles here. All right. So those are our sleep stages, um, we're going to kind of refer back to them a few different times, but what does your body actually do while you're sleeping? Um, I'm going to touch on these six things, starting with your circadian rhythm. Um, if you've heard of your circadian rhythm before, it's really just a process in your body that coordinates your mental and your physical systems. So your brain, your digestion, all of that kind of stuff. When we're referring to sleep, we are talking about our sleep-wake cycle. Um, your sleep-wake cycle is sensitive to light. Um, so when it's light outside, you're more awake. And when it starts getting darker, um, your body starts producing a hormone called melatonin, and it actually starts creating sleepy, sleepy vibes, we're going to call them, in your body. So that circadian rhythm is really important to help get you to get into that sleep, I guess, cycle, habit, routine, whatever it may be there. Um, there are a few different things that can affect your circadian rhythm that can in effect, um, harm your sleep wake cycle as well. Um, things like jet lag shift work. Um, some people are night owls and they can stay up really, really late, but they can't wake up super early. And sometimes if they have to wake up early for something that throws off their entire circadian rhythm. So something to be aware of is where your current circadian rhythm is at, and then knowing that if you were to change your routine, it might take a couple weeks for your body to like get back on track there. Um, healing and muscle repair, this was mentioned in stage three. So that deep sleep on the bottom is where our muscles repair, where our body is kind of refreshing. Um, a hormone called growth hormone actually is released and it is to help heal your muscles grow your muscles. That's why babies sleep so much so they can grow nice and strong. Um, and then cell reproduction and cell regeneration. Laura's going to touch on that in a little bit as well. I'm going to pop down to your nervous system here. You have a parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system. Um, your sympathetic nervous system, which is what we're going to be talking about, is your fight or flight response. So when you're in a dangerous situation, um, your body's initial reaction is that sympathetic nervous system. It's keeping you alive. Um, when you are sleeping, that sympathetic nervous system gets to relax. You're kind of in this state where you can breathe, <laughs> right? If you are lacking sleep, that sympathetic, sympathetic nervous system action is actually a lot higher. So when you don't have as much sleep, you get jumpy, you're all over the place. And so that's why it's really important to get the sleep so that we aren't always on edge, right? I've been on edge before. <laughs> it happens to the best of us. Um, I'm going to pop kind of kitty corner down to blood flow and blood pressure. Um, I mentioned in kind of stage one, stage two, mostly stage three, that blood flow and blood pressure decreases 
as you're sleeping, you're resting, you're relaxing, your body doesn't have to work as hard to get the nutrients where it needs to go. However, when you wake up, all of that pops back up to its quote unquote normal rate. Um, so it's actually a higher likelihood of having a heart attack when you wake up in the morning than overnight or during the day when you're awake because of that stark difference in the blood pressure and the blood flow in your body system. So ideally, especially if you have a lot of um, heart risk factors, ideally you're easing yourself awake so you don't startle yourself into a heart attack. Nothing super concerning, but most, um, a majority of heart attacks do happen in the morning because of that phenomenon. Um, I'm gonna pop into the immune system. I'm gonna take a little bit more time on this one. Um, so we have something called an innate or an adaptive immunity. So our immune system is made up of white blood cells and we're just gonna say white blood cells and inflammation. So when you're sick, when you're injured, when you get cut, um, you have the redness, you have the heat and you have the inflammation swelling and that's your immune system working. Um, so say I'm, I am, I'm allergic to dogs. <laughs> so we'll say I'm allergic to dogs. So what my body does when pet dander gets into my system is I start having a runny nose. I start having a cough, whatever it may be. That is my innate immune system. So that is my body knowing that this isn't good for my body. So it starts to kind of attack that cell, that dander, whatever it may be. When you encounter a cold virus, um, your body doesn't always react right away, but you do start getting sick. You start feeling all of those symptoms. Um, next time your body encounters that cold virus, you're actually gonna re start responding better. You're gonna start feeling those symptoms a little bit quicker because that's your immune system working faster and reacting better. That's your adaptive immunity. When you are sleeping, you actually can increase the, I guess, skills of your adaptive immunity. Um, your immune system's memory is increased when you sleep. So you have a better chance of fighting off the things your body has seen before the more you sleep. Um, so it's super cool because it all kind of works in conjunction with each other. Um, final thing, a kind of about inflammation here. Um, our bodies, regardless of if we're sick, we're injured, whatever, actually are more inflamed while we're sleeping. Um, this is mostly kind of a, a quote unquote safety precaution. When you're awake, if your body were to be that inflamed, to be trying to heal itself, all of the other functions in the body wouldn't be working as well. So this um, inflammation in our body while we're sleeping is really, really important because not only can we focus on healing and regenerating everything in our immune system, um, but our circadian rhythm is giving off that melatonin that I mentioned earlier. And that melatonin helps decrease any of the stress hormones that come with inflammation. So it kind of helps even everything out with that immune system. It's super cool to see how everything works together, especially while we're sleeping. Um, finally, oh, <laughs> brain waves. We can talk about it from either page. It's okay. Um, brain waves just wanted a quick mention while you're awake, your brain waves, uh, frequency of your brain waves, they're usually pretty high. So the more alert, the more awake you are, the higher the frequency of the brain waves in your brain. When you're sleeping, they slow down. They're a little bit smaller brain waves. And that's when that kind of restorative healing comes in. Um, again, stage three, well, or stage two, rather, while we're making those memories, it's a little bit slower, nothing super crazy. Um, the next slide then is just a different way to look at everything. Um, I wanted to kind of mention muscle activity throughout the stages of sleep. Stage one doesn't really change. You're twitching a little bit. Stage two and stage three, that muscle activity decreases. That's when we're in our deeper sleeps. We're in our recovery. Um, in our REM cycle, our muscle activity technically increases, but you're par paralyzed. <laughs> you're um, not going to react to everything, but those muscles do kind of want to move a little bit. And again, when you're awake, your muscle activity is higher than when you're sleeping. Imagine that. Um, muscle repair happens again, mostly in stage three, not so much stage one and two, um, but for sure in stage three, REM cycle and wake, it's not that your muscles and body don't repair while you're awake. They just do it better in stage three. Um, heart rate decreases 
pretty much through stage one through three, specifically in stage three, dropping as we're in that deep sleep. REM cycle actually increases your heart rate, your blood pressure, and your breathing rate. You're in a vivid dream. You are seeing these things happening around you while you're dreaming. That heart rate, blood pressure, and breathing rate all increase. Um, and then our brain waves. I just thought this was super cool information. I don't have a ton more beyond the names of it and kind of the frequency in it. Um, but the brain waves in stage one are your alpha brain waves. These are kind of your relaxation, your meditative brain waves, um, wakeful meditation. Um, your theta waves are where you're deeply relaxed. You're starting to create those memories. That's your theta waves. Your delta waves are really, really slow, calm, slow waves, deepest relaxation possible. And then when you're awake, you have beta waves which is alert, engaged. Right now, you probably have the beta waves in your brain, unless you're really, really focused. Then they're gamma rays and they're going crazy. Um, but hopefully you're just kind of in the, in the beta wave right now. I just thought it was super cool to look into those. So if you have more information, maybe you can look up more if you're interested in more brainwave stuff as well. I think back to Laura or over to Laura. Thank you, Susie. Yeah. Um, so I thought this quote was really great. Um, sleep is a period during which the brain is engaged in a number of, act of activities necessary to life, which are closely linked to quality of life. That's from neurologist Mark Wu. Um, I just thought that really ties into how we think about sleep, how we really need to know and practice that sleep is very important. All right. So we're going to talk about a little bit of what Susie mentioned as well, some brain biology and how sleep significantly impacts brain function. So first, sleep impacts our brain function by brain plas plasticity. Oh my goodness, that's a tough one. And that is the ability to adapt to input of information. Sleep also helps process information that we have learned and promotes easier access to that information. So if you've ever had a big test that you were studying for, and you're really tired, and you're trying to read and trying to focus, the next morning, you don't recall that information very well because that sleep, you didn't have that time for your brain and the biology of the brain to put that into long-term memory, like Susie mentioned. Sleep, all, sleep also helps with making and creating new memories and again, recalling those memories. Sleep regulates hormones such as cortisol, which many of you know helps manage stress, human growth hormone that helps with muscle tissue and repair that Susie was also mentioning. Insulin, um, which regulates blood glucose and other hormones as well. Sleep also impacts cell turnover, which rids waste from your cells, leaving your immune system restored to its optimal health. Of course, you've always heard that getting plenty of sleep, plenty of rest while you're sick will help. And that goes from when you're not feeling sick as well. That's going to help with your immune system. I'm a mom with two small kids and I know my sleep schedule is off a lot of days, but I notice when I don't get that adequate amount of sleep that I'm more susceptible to illnesses. So we just really have to make sure to try to get that adequate amount of sleep. It also helps promote more specifically the removal of a protein called beta amyloid. An overabundance of beta amyloid has been associated with Alzheimer's disease, which when you don't get enough sleep, that protein will build up over time. And the more that you have built up, the more chances of getting Alzheimer's and dementia later on in life. All right, sleep deprivation. Yes, all of us have had some sleep deprivation at some point in our lives, which is just basically the simplest form is getting less than a recommended amount of sleep per night. Oh no, in the chat it says I scared someone. <laughs> don't worry, don't worry, we got some great things coming your way. So some of the negative effects of sleep deprivation, many of you know this, impaired attentiveness, decreased coordination, decreased reaction time, decreased immune function, like we mentioned, the increased risk of obesity, which is a BMI of 30 or higher, increase in blood pressure, increase the risk of heart attack, increase the risk of diabetes and depression. It also increases your body aches and pains. And Lastly, it increases the erratic behavior of your hunger hormones. Now the two main hunger regulation hormones are 
I'm going to probably say this wrong, but that's, that's just fine, as gremlin, 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 the hunger hormone, which regulates food intake messages, and it actually comes from your stomach, and it messages that to your brain. And leptin, which is a hormone that controls a long-term energy balance, aka the satisfactory hormone. All right, how long can you last without sleep before you start to see brain function impairment within your body? So staying up for 16 hours straight, that's the start of the mental um, deterioration. And 19 to 20 hours of no sleep, you're at the mental capacity of being impaired, also referred to as someone who is legally intoxicated behind the wheel, so very similar. Um, moms and dads out there, you have felt that. I have felt that as well. Sleep deprivation is a real thing. And so I thought this was just um, really interesting information. So next we're gonna talk about mental health and sleep and how they are, <laughs> um, how they are correlated. So sleep and mental health are closely linked but not completely understood. Sleep helps enhance both mental and emotional resilience while sleep deprivation sets the stage for negative thinking and emotional vulnerability. Like Susie mentioned, we can be a little short, a little impatient um, when we're a little on edge, when we haven't gotten the full amount of sleep. Now, this is what's interesting. Let's go back, let's go down to the third or the fourth bullet point. I want you to think about what is true. Mental health illnesses increases the risk of sleep issues or sleep issues increases the risk for mental health illnesses. Now, if you guessed both, you're correct. Both of them are actually correct. So this is where that correlation is linked, but not completely understood. Um, experts are now treating sleep disorders to also help with mental illness. And we'll talk about a few of the mental illnesses on the next slide here that also um, have a correlation with your sleep interruptions or sleep issues. Okay, so some problems that are common amongst people with sleep disorders or sleep problems, those who have anxiety, depression, bipolar disorder, attention deficit disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder, and obsessive compulsive disorder. And when you think about it, a lot of this makes sense. If you have anxiety, you can't settle your mind, your body, you can't get that adequate amount of rest. But if you don't get that adequate amount of rest, that's going to increase those symptoms or magnify those symptoms of your anxiety. Um, so this is just very really inf um, important information to know as well. Okay, how to improve your sleep hygiene. Friends, oh my goodness, this is going to be so much fun. So if you're not taking notes, you better. No, I'm just kidding, this is recorded. So let's talk about our sleep hygiene. So first we wanna stick to a sleep schedule. It's important to go to bed and get up at the same time every day, even on the weekends. Consistency in your sleep schedule encourages your body with that sleep-wake cycle. And we want to establish a sleep routine. We'll talk a little bit going forward about maybe what your routine might look like. Maybe some things that you wanna to add to your sleep routine. Um, eating and drinking, your last meal of the day should be at a maximum of three hours before bed. Avoid going to bed hungry or too satisfied. And we want to avoid those heavy meals, again, going to about three hours before bed. Avoid nicotine, caffeine, and alcohol. This is why, because the stimulants like nicotine and caffeine take hours to pass through your body. And alcohol, although you may feel sleepy after drinking alcohol, it actually interrupts the quality of your sleep. Let's limit some daytime naps. If you are a person that feels refreshed after a nap, go right ahead, but keeping your nap 30 minutes or less per day would be appropriate. If you're an individual who works nights, a nap later in the day before work is appropriate to make up for that sleep debt. All right, create a restful sleep environment. So of course you wanna think of cool, dark and quiet, three words. Let's set our room temperatures to 65 to 70 degrees Fahrenheit. This is due to the fact that our internal temperature drops during sleep. So by having the room cool, it helps contribute to a good night's sleep 
by mimicking our natural temperature drop. Invest in quality bedding. Invest in bedding that is comfortable and relaxes you. Minimize light and sounds. Of course, keep the room as dark as possible. Avoid noises that are 40 to 70 decibels. For example, 40 decibels of sound um, can be correlated with bird calls, a dripping faucet. I know that drives me nuts. And while 70 decibels is a sound of a vacuum cleaner, the radio, or a TV. Um, avoid light um, immuning devices. Devices can increase your or and reset your body's internal clock. I'm talking about cell phones, tablets, TV, computer, all of that. Um, and some of the considerations that I have here would be banning those electronic devices from your room altogether. Um, I know that a lot of people keep their phone charged in the kitchen away from their bedroom. So that's the, they don't even think about it. They don't check their phone or I'm notorious for looking at my phone while I'm laying down. And so just getting rid of that, um, that device, having some room darkening shades, earplugs, a fan that is going on low to kind of hum out any unwanted noise would be appropriate as well. All right, physical activity. Um, physical activity can promote better sleep, but avoid being active too close to bedtime. So we want to do that physical activity every day, but we want to say, stay away from any strenuous activity about 90 minutes to three hours before bed. Maintain a healthy body composition is important since obesity is the highest contributing um, factor to sleep disorders. And let's talk about managing stress. And so this is important right before bed to start journaling your emotions down if you think that will help. So I find that journaling my stress or what I need to do for the day and just leave it in on paper will help me go to sleep with a clear and empty mind. Trying some aromatherapy, some meditation, deep breathing techniques, or simply keeping a gratitude journal will really help with your managing um, stress. All right, so say you're still not sleepy. Let's try some of these tricks and tips. Get out of bed and do something that it promotes relaxation. So say you're laying in bed and you're just like, I just can't fall asleep. So try some aromatherapy, some lavender. I know that helps stimulate this relaxation. Meditation, reading a book. Again, some deep breathing exercises, gentle stretches, gentle yoga. Drink a cup of decaf herbal tea, or maybe take a warm bath or shower. Thank you, Laura, for going into more depth on that brain biology and some awesome tips and tricks. So now you may be thinking to yourself, what now? And I've talked to a lot of people and they're saying, I've tried everything. I can't go to sleep. And so we're here to kind of, you have all those ideas now, but here we can implement it. So I have a few different resources to help you track and see what you're trying and to see if that's going to work for you. Um, first off, if you are not on Healthier Together yet, um, visit healthiertogether.medtronic.com. It is free to all employees. Um, you can download the app and you can use it on, use it on desktop or um, your app, iOS, Android, all the things. Um, this is where a few of the resources I'll be mentioning come from. So the first um, would be healthy habits and sleep journal. So uh, we've created this sleep journal on the right here. Um, it is a fillable PDF um, and it's got areas where you can write in how many hours you slept. You can, there's a drop down menu for your mood. Um, this is a great place to start on tracking your sleep and noting the time you're in bed, if you did your pre-bed routine, you know, the time of your last meal, then you can see in the morning, you know, how many hours of sleep did you get? How many times were you awake? Your current mood. Um, it's a great place to start because you may be thinking, I've tried everything. I still can't sleep, but you need some data, to, you know, to help you decide where to go next. So this sleep journal is a great place to start. Um, when you have this slide deck, this uh, sleep journal is linked so you can download that PDF. The next thing is healthy habits. 
So on Healthier Together, there are over 280 some healthy habits that you can use. There's 18 specifically just for sleeping well. And you can add all of these habits um, to your, um, like your, your profile and you can choose uh, whichever ones you'd like and you can track them to see, you know, did I darken my room? Did I change my scenery? If I was trying to sleep, um, was it device free? And those are all great things for you to take note and notice maybe I didn't do this. So I didn't have as good a sleep. And then you can decide how you're going to um, change your schedule, change your routine to improve your sleep habits. Because we all want to feel more rested, but we have to figure out the ways to feel more rested. Um, the next is Will. So this is another program on Healthier Together. Uh, and up top, this is linked here. So you can um, find our how to access Will if you're don't know how to access it, but there's a million, okay, not a million, there's a lot of resources, um, uh, sessions. I mean, some of these are five sessions, six sessions, and these range anywhere from one minute videos all the way up to 30 minute guided sleep meditations. So this is a great place just for some more information, um, ways to sleep better, um, because there are so many different ways that work for people. So like for me, I have to have a fan going at night and my fiance listens to a podcast every night, but it's just low enough where I can't hear it. And so it's perfect for me. And like, that's how I go to sleep instantly, but for other people, they need it dead silent. So try all these different things and see what's going to work for you. And then lastly, um, Virgin Pulse Sleep Guide. So this is a great resource. Um, you can find this. Um, and when you open up the sleep guide, there is a series of questions that you ask that you answer um, to figure out how you want to sleep, what time you normally go to bed, um, what you think you might want to work on first. And then it recommends tips, uh, different habits that you can track, and you can get rewarded for doing this as well. So now we're going to move into an interactive portion where we want to know what have you tried in the past for improving your sleep? What are a few things you've tried? So to do this, you'll click on those three little dots on your video uh, meeting, your floating meeting controls and view options. And then you'll click on annotate and you can choose text. You can change the color if you want. So we want to know what have you tried in the past to improve your sleep? So once again, view options, annotate. And you have to click on the text and then you can type in. And if you can't figure out how to do that, you can also throw it in the chat. So we got to comment, the will sessions are amazing. And I have to agree. I just recently started checking them out and that has helped a lot. And we have 230 people. So <laughs> it's going to like blob over each other. But yes, noise machine, warm showers, guided meditations, aromatherapy, taking a walk, earplugs. Yes, using like the blue light blocking glasses. So we'll give you guys a few, another minute or so, sleep machine, breathing exercises. Yes, all great things. And this is great to notice here that we have, you know, over 230 people here and all of us are posting different things. Some are similar, but we all have different ways that help us sleep. That's why it's important to use that sleep journal or another journal of some sorts to track and notice uh, your improvement or not improvement. Yes, cool temperature, cool pillow. Awesome, thank you. All right, moving on. I'm trying to move on. Okay, so what will you try now? So what did you learn today? What's something that someone else has recommended or what's something that you learned that you thought was interesting about the biology? Uh, what will you try or what have you learned? So you can annotate again or post in the chat. All 
Uh, so someone had commented, do sleep machines work? I'm interested, but then I changed my mind because I don't wanna have other things on my nightstand. Yeah, I mean, a great place to start would be, yeah, using the Will app. They have um, different like calming night sounds or like Spotify, YouTube, Pandora, they all have like fan at like cooling fan and you can just listen to a fan noise and uh, or rain, sometimes like night rain sounds. So you can try that before you like buy an actual machine. You can listen to it on your phone, tablet. Yeah, definitely finding one that works. Central oil diffusers, yep, lavender is amazing for helping. Yes, I can second that. Yes, all are great things. Thank you so much for sharing. So lastly, we need to put this into action now. You've learned all this great information about sleep. You've heard what other people have tried. You've learned some new information. So now we want you to claim it into the universe and you're gonna make this happen. How are you going to get there? So I'd like you to post in the chat or annotate one thing that you will do today to improve your sleep. Maybe it's registering for Healthier Together. Maybe it's, uh, printing off the sleep journal, uh, adding healthy habits, writing down your routine. What's one thing that you will do today? Yes, we've got good questions here. We'll get to in a minute. So you're putting this out into the world. We are all your accountability buddies. So this is that one thing that you are going to do today. And um, after you write it down, I want you to take a piece of paper or open up a note in your phone, a note on your computer. And I want you to write that down. Like this is what I'm going to do today so that you can make it happen. Yeah, sleep journal, night walks, awesome. Thank you all so much for sharing. So now we have a few questions that we'll get to. I clear all these drawings. All right, so a few questions that came through in the chat. Someone says, what about staying asleep versus getting to sleep? Susie or Laura, do you have any ideas or comments? I did throw this in the chat too, but um... Having an eye mask, I have found, um, I also have a puppy. So like puppy is all over the place too, but having the eye mask while I'm sleeping actually keeps the distraction. Like if I wake up in the middle of the night, like I have this dark covering over my eyes so that I don't get distracted by my phone. I don't look at my phone and I can just more quickly fall back into that sleep. Um, or if it's a little bit harder, I'll just take some really, really slow deep breaths. Um, Otherwise, just starting back at the top, kind of, um, of the restarting the music or something along those lines to help you fall asleep a little bit better. Um, there are some cooling eye masks. I know somebody just mentioned eye masks are really, really hot, um, but there are some on Amazon, I want to say, somewhere where it actually like cools your eyes so it doesn't feel as hot. Um, option if you don't want to have like an eye mask actually on your face. Sometimes I just put like a pillowcase over my head instead of actually having the thing around my head as well. I've done a lot. <laughs> and another thing I'll add too is you had mentioned, um, so I'd also use an eye mask and the, there's a lot of research that that's part of your routine that as you pull it down, like that is you signaling your brain, okay, we're going to sleep now. So that's an easy way to get you into sleep. Um, but then if you do wake up in the middle of the night, do not look at your phone. Don't look at your alarm clock. Don't look at what time it is. Because like Laura had mentioned in the, those, you know, the blue light from your phone, especially if you don't have it on like a warmer mode, that that's going to reset your internal clock. And that's going to make it even harder to get to sleep. Um, so yeah, don't look at your phone. Try to keep your eyes shut and, you know, find that comfortable position that you know you can fall asleep in. Um, Laura, do you have any input? 
Yeah, that's a great question. So I have gotten a lot of those questions before. Um, and if it's a chronic issue, um, some people just say, oh, it happens every now and then. Some people, you know, um, get up in the middle of the night to use the restroom or, you know, there's various things that wakes them, that wakes them up in the middle of the night. Um, you know, if it's to go use the restroom, try to limit any food or liquid, you know, up to three or four hours before bed, that should hopefully help. Um, you know, I know that a lot of people who have, like I stated before, had some other, um, and maybe anxiety and depression. So it is hard for them to go back to sleep. It is hard for them to kind of ease back into it. So, you know, we always want to mention if you're having these sleep struggles, if you are, you know, chronically having to wake up in the middle of the night or not getting enough sleep to definitely see your physician and see if there's something else that they can recommend for you. Um, of course, we can give you all the knowledge that we have, but they'll give you a better idea if this is something that's underlining, that's a little bit more important to focus on, um, maybe a little bit more serious to focus on. But like Anna and Susie mentioned, if you wake up in the middle of the night, um, don't look at your phone, don't look at the TV, don't turn any of that on, just lay in bed, try to take some deep breaths. Again, some people are mentioning doing some meditation, listening to a little um, story or a song, hopefully that will get you back, easing your body back into that sleep. And so, and hopefully you have less instances of waking up in the middle of the night. Um, real quick to add on top of that, <laughs> all the fun information. Um, when you do say have to wake up in the middle of the night and go to the bathroom, try to get a nightlight in your bathroom. So you don't have to turn on like Bathrooms usually have the brightest, whitest light so that you can see when you're getting ready in the morning. But at night, that bright light, no good. <laughs> um, so if you can find uh, like a night light or something that's just always on in your bathroom so you don't have to turn on that really bright light, that might help as well um, if you do happen to wake up and go to the bathroom a lot. And then if you are waking up you know, a lot in the night too, um, I was reading some chat questions, so Laura might have touched on this. I don't know if I would got caught up in the chat, um, but you know, something that I did because I was really struggling with this sleeping and chronic migraines is I, you know, spoke to my physician, and they recommended I get a sleep study done, and I now sleep with a dental appliance to help with my grinding, and I have TMJ and lots of other issues for my migraines, um, and that has immensely helped my sleep. So you know, if you try some of these things and still just isn't working for you really you know, consult with your doctor, um, your dentist, if you want to try, you know, like a night appliance and, or a TMJ specialist. And, you know, that could be an answer to, you could have obstructive sleep apnea or, you know, some other sleep disorder. And um, it's definitely important to talk to your doctor if you're try a few things and it's still not helping. Um, so I think that is all the time we have for today. We want to be mindful of everyone's time. If you have an additional questions, Feel free to connect with anyone on our team. Our information is listed here. Uh, like I said, I will be uh, sending out the slide deck to all the attendees. It'll The recording and the slide deck will be posted to Yammer and we'll upload it to um, the YouTube channel. Um, you'll have to check with your insurance provider if to figure out if that's covered under your insurance. Um, thank you all so much for joining. Um, to earn points today, for attending this webinar. Um, Kyle, you made a tip video on how to record if you attend a webinar. I'm not sure if you could speak to that right now. I don't remember exactly the steps on how to do together. Do you remember? Are you here still? Yeah, I'm still here. Uh, say the question one more time. How to? There, you made a tip video once on about how to uh, track webinar to get points. Do you remember that? I do. Um, I'll have to look through it. Uh, yeah. The videos that we made, um, and um, I'll post it uh, as a link to because um, Anna, this will be posted to our like our Yammer page, you know, with the yeah. Or, yep. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll look for that once I find the link. Um, I'll post it um, in the little comment section um, of this recording, um, so that way you can take a look at how to earn points uh, for participating in a webinar. Yeah, someone said how to earn and then find the webinar section. I think that is, yep, that's the right spot. Um, so you can get rewarded for attending. So if you have any more questions, feel free to throw them in the chat. We'll be here, but thank you all so much for joining. Our next webinar is August 19th.
at noon central time again same time third thursday and it'll be on running so we have our friends from fleet feet joining us for some um, shoe fitting kind of process understanding how finding your right shoe but then some more general running tips so yeah we'll send the invite to everybody thank you Yes, we can include walking on that one too. Thanks everybody. All right, I'm just going to end the meeting for the people who probably are just like hanging out. <laughs> yes, I will be sending the invite um, to all the attendees for the next webinar. All right, thanks everybody.